All right, guys, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to have our tech person log on and see if he can help Amelia. Um, otherwise, we'll save her portion till the end. So again, welcome to those just joining us. My name is Annie Holland. I'm the Community Engagement and Exhibits Manager here at the Space Science Institute. Thank you so much for joining us. This is actually uh, the most interest we've had in one of these webinars in quite some time. So I'm very excited to see uh, so many people interested in hosting um, these sets of exhibits. Um, if, like Amelia, you're having trouble with your audio, there is an audio button up at the top of your screen. If your internet's flaky, it might drop in and out, so please do feel free to kind of disconnect and reconnect your audio up there at the top. It won't affect anything on our end, um, and if that's not working for you, uh, go ahead and type down in the chat box and we'll see um, what we can do for you. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so our agenda for today, really quick, I'm going to go over what the structure of this webinar is going to be. Um, we're going to talk about the Discover Exoplanets uh, project writ large um, and how Starnet and NASA's Universe of Learning uh, are participating. Uh, walk you guys through both exhibits. I'm very excited. Normally when we do these webinars, I do not have any pictures or drawings or anything helpful for you um, of the exhibits and everyone's always mad at me. Uh, but thankfully, um, we managed to get um, our RFP process for our fabricator pushed through. So I do actually have really neat 3D drawings um, of what these two exhibits are going to look like. So I'm very excited to share those. Um, then we'll get to the boring part of the call. We will walk through all the application questions and make sure they make sense to everybody, um, as well as the requirements for hosting the exhibitions. Um, and then lastly, um, anyone who is typing questions down there in the chat box, again, type them at any time throughout the webinar and I'll kind of copy paste them over into our little document. Um, we'll be going through those at the end. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if anyone has too complicated of a question, I will go ahead and unmute you so that you can ask that question. Excuse me. Um, and again, for those of you just joining us, um, my apologies for my uh, attire. We have our office Christmas party today and we had an ugly sweater contest. So that's the dinosaur excuse I'm willing to give you. Um, and that's also why I'm the only person on the webinar today. Everybody else is um, off having a party, but this is more fun, I think. All right, so really quick, the um, important disclaimer language I need to get out of the way. Uh, Discover Exoplanets is made possible um, through NASA funding, through NASA's Universe of Learning. Um, Universe of Learning materials are based upon work supported by NASA under award number NNX16AC65A to the Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, project partners on that larger grant are Caltech, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and Sonoma State University. Uh, the Space Science Institute folks, the Starnet folks, we are a subcontract under the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, part, of this con uh, part of this project. It is a huge project, as the name might imply, um, and we are a small, fun little piece of it. Um, the exhibition and educational support materials and outreach activities are all part of the Star Library Education Network, which is a hands-on learning program for libraries and their communities, um, as well as that larger NASA Universe of Learning program. Boring part out of the way. <laughs> so really quick, I'm going to do an introduction to StarNet. Um, if Amelia gets her microphone um, and sound working, um, she'll talk to you a little bit about NASA's Universe of Learning. Um, if not, I'll give you the quick version um, and we can try to get her on again at the end. Um, so the StarNet program, which many of you, if you're a library, um, are probably familiar with, we seek to engage underserved youth and their families in fostering an appreciation and deeper understanding of science and technology topics through STEM programs in public libraries and then library collaborations with scientists, engineers, um, and other informal learning organizations. So that's where you museum folks come in. Um, I've just included a couple of pictures that are kind of indicative of the stuff that we do here at StarNet. Um, StarNet grew about nine years ago when we started. We had a couple local libraries doing STEM stuff. Um, not many people were, were interested, frankly. We would try to get exhibits out to libraries and they'd say, oh, that's, that's not what we do. Um, but that's certainly grown. We now have 9,000 um, members on our online community of practice. 
Um, those of you who aren't familiar with libraries, there's about 17,000 libraries across the country, and we have representation from a good chunk of them um, at this point. And now we have hundreds of people <laughs> applying for things instead of me begging for people to take them. Um, so we do um, exhibits, activities, professional development training, support for STEM activities um, in libraries across the country. Again, these are just some pictures um, of our exhibits as well as some training that we've done. Um, oh, good, Amelia's on now. Um, that picture you see up at the top right, you'll notice that blue line that's mostly obscured in the continental U.S. there. That was the path of totality for the um, eclipse back in August. We actually provided free solar viewing glasses to libraries and some museums. Um, across the country, we were able to get our stuff out to over 7,000 um, unique library venues and locations. Um, so we're very proud of that, and it means many of you um, even if you are a library, didn't hear about us until that August eclipse. So we're really excited um, that our network has grown and that we're able to work with more people. Uh, the museum folks on the line, you probably remember us too. We just haven't been doing as much museum stuff recently. Um, historically, the Space Science Institute has done museum uh, traveling exhibitions. Um, we are federally funded 100%, so we kind of go where the funding goes. Um, we're very excited, though, to have this opportunity uh, to bring our two passions, libraries and museums, together uh, to help them form meaningful and we're hoping long-lasting partnerships. Um, so this is very much an experiment on our side. We're very, very happy that JPL and STSCI um, trusted us enough to let us move forward in this. Um, and on that note, then, I'm going to uh, pass the mic over to Amelia Chapman. Amelia is from uh, the Museum Alliance, which um, most of you here probably know about already, but she'll tell you a little bit more about that, as well as NASA's Universe of Learning, who is um, our funding agency for the Great. purposes of this program. Can you hear me? <laughs> Go ahead, Amelia. Oops. Can you hear me? We thought we had Amelia. Let's try. Oh, there's two Amelias. One second, everybody. <laughs> well, people are saying yes on the chat, so I think it means you are hearing me. I hear myself echoing. So I'm just going to go ahead and talk because it sounds like people are hearing me, even if Danny doesn't. <laughs> uh, so again, I'm Amelia, and you may know me from the Museum Alliance, but I'm also helping out with NASA's University of Learning Project. Oh, okay. people only hear the echo. <laughs> and I, I don't know if it means that people are hearing me through someone else's speaker. Okay. I don't know what to do right now. Annie, nope, you can hear me, so maybe you just want to go ahead. Okay, I'm being told to try again, and the echo in my head sounds different. <laughs> okay, well, I just have a couple of sentences, so I'm going to say them. If you hear it, great. If you don't, catch it later in the transcript. Uh, this is Amelia. I'm just giving a little introduction about NASA's Universe of Learning. It's an integrated astrophysics, STEM learning, and literacy program. And the idea is that it serves audiences all, of all ages using many different platforms. So we're providing a direct connection to the science and missions from across the NASA astrophysics division. And the exhibit you're hearing about today is one component. There are many different ways to participate with Universal Learning. And I wanted to point out the website as a great, great place to learn more. So that is the site you're seeing here. It is universe-learning.org. Um, I don't know if I can click through, but the next slide would be useful. All right, I circled it. If you go to the website, you'll see resources at the top and in the next slide.
Under resources, you'll see these four things, which I highly recommend you check out. I'm not going to talk about them anymore because I think it might be too annoying. But just one more time, it's universeoflearning.org. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Amelia. I'm sorry about that. Um, everyone who had a hard time hearing and sorry, Amelia, we <laughs> couldn't get it fixed for you. Um, Amelia is going to go ahead and type some of that information down in the chat box so that you all, ooh, that's very loud now, uh, so that you all have access to it. So no worries if you missed that part. I think it will, um, it will sound better in the recording. I was able to hear just fine, um, but Amelia is going to type some of that information down there for you. So thank you for that, Amelia. <laughs> Um, and it did sound like a lot of people here are already familiar with the Museum Alliance, but if you wouldn't mind putting that information down in the chat box as well, I would really appreciate it. Thanks. All right, guys, so let's get into the meat of these exhibits here. Um, so I just want to give you the quick rundown of this program. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a partnership program. So the idea is that geographically co-located um, library and museum partners will receive uh, different but complementary exhibits. So there is only one piece um, that is the same across those two exhibits. So for those of you who asked questions about um, if your patrons and your visitors would benefit from going to both, the answer is absolutely yes. They are almost entirely separate exhibitions. Um, the people who are selected to participate in this program um, will be brought in um, at our expense um, to an in-person training in or around Boulder, Colorado. Uh, the people invited to that will be one library and one museum representative per site pair. Uh, we'll talk about that a little more with the Q&A at the end. Uh, we are developing activities and resources for this program. Um, it's important to note that with the support of the Universe of Learning program, that opens up a lot of other stuff that we'll be able to get you guys and get you training for. Um, we're hoping that the sites that are selected when they come out to Colorado for that training, there will be representatives um, from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the Space Telescope Science Institute um, who are able to come and walk through some of those activities and resources for us, which is just an unparalleled opportunity. It's going to be great. Um, that said, if you are not selected to participate in this program, we will also be doing webinars around the content and the activities and resources. Um, so if you're not chosen, those webinars are free and open to everybody. It's our normal um, StarNet webinar series, um, open to libraries and museums. Um, so you guys are definitely welcome to join us on those. Um, if you are not already um, a member of our newsletter mailing list, please do send me an email and let me know so that I can add you. I'm going to type my email address down in the chat box really quick. Um, and do make sure you let me know which newsletters you're interested in. Um, I'm going to assume the StarNet one, which is where all of these webinars will be promoted. But if you're a museum person, um, do also let me know that so that I can add you to our museum list as well. Um, so we will, like I mentioned, have nine total sites for this program. Eight of those will be chosen through this competitive application process, and then there'll be a shakedown site in Colorado where, we'll test, where we will test everything out. Um, again, like I mentioned, um, these groups, as well as anyone who just stays connected, will have access to NASA Museum Alliance activities and webinars. Um, and then the sites chosen who receive the exhibit um, will receive technical support um, from us here at the Space Science Institute. So if you've never done an exhibit before, if you've never done STEM programming before, we will provide you with the supports and the help that you need to do that. We're not expecting everyone here to already um, be experts. In fact, we're hoping to reach people who haven't done this kind of stuff before. Um, so if that was your question, you are welcome to be here. <laughs> so the big idea of our exhibit um, so the Discover Exoplanets exhibition provides an introduction to the search for life on other planets, as well as the tools that NASA scientists use to search for those ex, uh, exoplanets. So the big idea, so that the, the big idea for us is just something, excuse me, is just something that um, we use to describe kind of our organizing theme for the exhibit. And that organizing theme um, is that NASA is finding habitable worlds in our own stellar neighborhood. Oh, thank you. Amelia pointed out, I keep not um, making sense of this. Amelia pointed out there will be eight site pairs, so 16 total venues, eight libraries, and eight museums um, that will host these exhibits. Um, so the co-located part that I mentioned, the library and the museum and the one community will get 
um, two separate sets of exhibits at the same time. So thank you, Amelia, for that. Um, I always forget to say that. Um, so our goals for visitors in these two exhibits are to understand how our solar system is alike and different from other solar systems we're finding, um, learn how NASA is searching for habitable worlds and what tools scientists use um, in this search, um, as well as gaining a better understanding of our place in space. Um, and that's just a nifty little way of saying um, we want people to understand concepts like scale, habitability, point of view, you know, constellations don't look the same everywhere in our universe, right? You can see them from all angles. Um, understanding that NASA uses different telescopes and tools to observe different types of objects. Um, no one uh, instrument can answer all the questions, right? People often ask, well, why are there so many ground-based and space-based and all these different telescopes? Well, because they do different things. Um, so we'll be able to, excuse me, start to answer those questions um, with this exhibition. So some requirements for host sites. So here's the important part. The application partners must be a public library. So there is um, no, no moving around that. It needs to be one public library. And then the second partner is a museum. Um, we define museums very loosely. Um, it can be a, <coughs> excuse me, museum can be a visitor center, a planetarium, some similar venue to that, but it is a library partner and some other sort of informal education venue. It does not need to be a science museum by any means. Um, also very important, yes, um, Renee asked, do they have to apply together? So for those of you who have logged on to the SurveyMonkey application, which I'll talk a bit more about later, um, a primary applicant will fill out the majority of the application. Um, we'll ask for the name institution DUNS number of the secondary applicant, but they do not need to fill out a separate application. So if the library is taking the lead, the library will fill out the majority of the application and they'll get a letter of support from the museum, planetarium, whatever, um, that they'll attach to the document um, or to the, to the survey rather. Um, so we do not need uh, both partner venues to fill out their own application. That's a very good question. Um, the next requirement, um, is that uh, between the two venues, they host a minimum of 10 public programs across the sites for different age groups. Um, so that means the library can host five and the museum can host five. Um, the library can host eight and the museum can host two. Uh, there is a minimum requirement that each venue must host two um, events. They can't all 10 be at one venue. Um, but any split amongst amongst that is fine. We do require that at least one of the programs takes advantage of resources um, at their partner venue. So whether that's someone from the museum coming to present at the library, uh, someone from the library bringing a bunch of books that can be checked out to the museum, whatever, um, just as long as that there is kind of cross collaboration across those venues. Um, we will also request that everyone participates in project evaluation. Uh, this includes following any reporting requirements which for the most part will just be um, participating in uh, the Museum Alliance posting events um, and then doing a end of exhibit report for me. Um, oops, phone's ringing. <laughs> technical difficulties over here. Um, and there are also potential site visits. So there is a project evaluator who might choose to visit some of you. We will not know who those are ahead of time. So everyone who um, wants to be, excuse me, participating in this process needs to be open to the idea of an evaluator coming to your site. Um, we'll also ask that everyone participates in the StarNet online community. Um, Brooks, as long as you're listening in now, I appreciate you leaving the party for me. If you wouldn't mind typing the uh, Community of Practice website down there, people keep calling. Excellent. Um, so that could just be, you know, checking out activities that we have on there, posting uh, reviews for us, blog posts, whatever. We just want you to be aware of that resource because it is very helpful. Uh, the venues each need to have a minimum ceiling height of eight feet. Um, so that's a typical ceiling height. That's not normally a problem. We do recommend 10 feet because some of the pieces will require you to kind of lift stuff up and slot them in. Um, so it'll be easier if you have extra clearance. Um, we have made sure to work with the fabricators um, so that every piece can be assembled on its side if you don't have those higher ceilings. So a standard ceiling is fine. Uh, for the museum, you'll either need a loading dock or double front doors. Um, that's just because some of the pieces might be a little bit wider or the crates might be wider. For the library piece, um, we realize that there's a lot of Carnegie libraries out there that have not been retrofitted. So you just need a standard sized doorway. You don't need a double door. You don't need a loading dock. 
Um, if your door is less than standard size, maybe email me and I'll double check um, that we fit in those requirements. But generally speaking, we design the library exhibit to fit pretty much anywhere. Um, the next big one here, and we'll talk about this um, in a moment, um, is that a constant internet connection is required for one piece in both of the exhibits. So this means it can't be a, a public login sort of Wi-Fi that someone will need to go type a password. If the internet's not connected, this piece isn't going to work. Um, that is just one of the pieces. Um, we do require that you have Wi-Fi to connect the other pieces too so that we can remote in and fix them, but they do not need to be constantly connected. Um, you also obviously need to have space to display the exhibit. Um, each exhibit is going to be approximately 600 square feet um, and a small amount of storage space as well. We're working with the fabricator to make sure that there's as little um, boxes and things that you have to store as possible, but there will be a little. Um, for the most part, um, the way we do our exhibit components is they're kind of like transformers. So the kiosk that houses the computer components actually flips in on itself. So it becomes its own shipping container. So there will be very little you have to store, um, but there will be probably at least one small crate um, per exhibit. Um, and if anyone's worried about that 600 square feet, it does not have to be contiguous square feet. So if you're um, kind of scattering the exhibit um, through your library or through your museum, if you have half of it in the lobby, half of it in a different room, that's totally fine. We do not require it to be um, all in one place. Um, and then lastly, um, you need to be able to have full replacement insurance coverage on the exhibit, which again, we'll talk about shortly here. Um, and then my last little encouragement to those of you who are still a little bit worried about if your venue's okay, rural and underserved areas are very strongly encouraged to apply. Um, this is a competitive application process. It's not to say that if you are in a, um, excuse me, a, a city venue that has a lot of resources, you're not eligible. You absolutely are. Um, but we are going to, to pay special attention to make sure that um, at least some of the sites that we choose um, might need a little extra help or don't have a lot of resources. So um, everyone is highly encouraged to apply, but do not think being rural or underserved puts you at a disadvantage. So let's get into the fun part. Like I said, we don't normally get pictures of the exhibit ahead of time uh, because it's being built. Um, but we did get our um, proposal back from our fabricator, um, our fabricator bids, and we were able to make a choice. So um, Flint Hills Design, which is located in Kansas, is going to be building the exhibit for us. Um, this is their tentative design drawing of the library exhibit pieces. Um, obviously, that might change as we move forward. There'll be text, not just pictures, but you get the general idea. Um, these will be very, very bright, very pretty, kind of space agey looking pieces. Excuse me. And I wanted to point out, if you, you look there behind L4, you'll see a little bench. Um, Flint Hills is very interested in making sure that there's as little that you guys have to store as possible. So that, that bench there is actually also storage um, to hold all of those poles that you see there. So um, we're, we're pretty excited that we found um, a fabricator who's going to be able um, to make something that's going to be one, easy for you guys to take up and down, but two, doesn't require a lot of extra storage space. Um, so that's the picture. Um, for those of you who haven't looked at the guidelines yet, um, this is kind of a written version of what all of those components are. Um, so if anyone is familiar with our StarNet exhibits, it's, it's going to be similar. We'll have an assortment of kiosks as well as pop-up banners, again, that are easy uh, to put up, um, describing all of the pieces. Um, Eyes on Exoplanets, uh, component L2 there, that is the piece that started all of this. Um, so Michael Green from JPL actually had us years and years ago uh, send some of these Eyes on Exoplanets pieces out to uh, libraries and visitor centers across the country to see if people would be interested in it. And thankfully, everyone was. Um, and that's why we've got this bigger exhibit program now. So this piece is really important, and it is actually the only piece um, that spans across both of the venues. It's in the library and the museum piece. Um, Susan, uh, this piece is the one that needs constant internet connection, the Eyes on Exoplanets piece, so good timing with your question there. Um, so this piece is really neat. What it does is it lets you explore um, recent NASA discoveries of um, extrasolar planets and planetary systems. Um, are they like Earth? Are they different? Um, it's a very, it's a, it's a nicely guided piece. 
Um, there is a more open-ended exploration piece that you guys are welcome to access right now just on, on the internet that you can get to. Um, but this piece, just so that you know, is more of a kiosk piece. It is more of a guided exploration. L3 is Planet Families. Um, that's a piece that we developed here at SSI years and years ago, and we uh, include in most of our exhibits because it's very exciting. Um, it's a free app that you can download if you want to play it. Um, but the idea is that you're trying to create your own solar system and a stable solar system at that. You can create black holes. You can have um, asteroid belts. It's a very fun piece. Um, L4 is going to be about transits, um, and so the idea there is one of the methods we use to detect exoplanets um, is to actually watch them transit across their host star. So we're going to have uh, your patrons will be able to kind of walk in front of a camera and create their own light curve, um, and then we'll have them view light curves from real um, exoplanet systems to try to match them up. Um, and I will, I do want to add here again, I know I said it on the last piece, but I will make it clear again here too. These are all tentative components. Um, we do need to still go through the whole design uh, process, and some of these might go, um, some of them might change, but generally speaking, um, this is the direction we're thinking of going as far as content, just to make that clear for everyone. Um, L5 is called Factor Fiction. This is my favorite piece. It's not going anywhere. Uh, so in this piece, uh, we actually take 30 second clips of Hollywood movies or TV shows um, that have to do with the content area. So I don't know, exoplanets, maybe we're talking about Star Wars and Tatooine, right? So we so show a 30 second clip of Luke looking up and seeing that Tatooine has two stars. Um, and then we ask the participants if they think that that is science fact or science fiction, right? Could a planet that has life Life on it have two stars? Um, they will answer that question. I won't give you the answer now. Um, and we'll actually be able, with Kepler and other space telescope data, we'll be able to provide kind of analogs. Like, well, we found this planet that might look like this. So it's going to be a really exciting piece. Um, and it's my excuse to have Star Wars in my exhibits. So uh, <laughs> component L6 is called Seeing the Unseen. Um, so this is about telescopes and wavelengths and how NASA um, scientists use those different wavelengths to look for objects in our universe. Um, so a really quick example, if you guys are familiar with the Orion Nebula, um, you, it's a star forming region, but in visible, just kind of looking at it through a normal telescope, uh, you can't see the stars that are forming because there's too much dust in the ray. So you might use an infrared telescope to look through that cloud to see what's going on. So this is going to be a very interactive piece. Um, kids will actually get the visible telescope image and they get um, a digital filter that they kind of hover over the image um, until they find the particular object that they're looking for. We were actually just demoing it this morning and it's pretty cool. Um, this piece will also, um, for the museum folks here who are familiar, will take advantage of some view space material um, that's going to be integrated. That's from the Space Telescope Science Institute and that will be in this piece as well. Um, and then lastly, for the libraries, uh, you will be getting a facilitation kit. So this is um, kind of activities in a box, right? We'll find some activities for you from our inventory um, and also from uh, JPL and STSCI um, of hands-on activities that are suitable for the library environment around the exoplanet um, astrophysics uh, sort of content area. Um, this will hopefully, again, put some asterisks here, depends on my budget, um, but I think it's going to work out. Um, we'll hopefully hopefully have a pair of VR goggles for you in there, um, and it, so you can, um, again, for facilitated programming, don't just leave them out, um, for your patrons to be able to actually walk through some recently discovered um, systems, such as the TRAPPIST um, planetary system. Um, we also hope to have a maker piece in there where your patrons will be able to create their own constellations um, and kind of like I was talking about with scale earlier, view them from different angles to realize that just because all these stars are in one constellation doesn't mean that they're actually related to one another. I don't understand that question. Liz, if you could um, repeat your question down there, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. All right, so let's move over to the museum pieces real quick. I realize I'm not going fast enough here, but I'm going to try. Um, so again, we've got our 3D rendering of what the museum components will look like. We've got a blow up there on the right hand side. There's going to be um, kind of a, a big hands on interactive constellation piece in there. And that's what that blow up is on your right. So moving into the list then, um, again, we have eyes on exoplanets and planet families. Um, apparently, there are two pieces that cross over. 
I had forgotten that. Um, my favorite piece um, in the museum component is this green screen interactive. So this is a piece that we've been doing a lot in our library exhibits. We stole, borrowed uh, the idea from the museum in Washington, D.C. Um, so the idea is we take your visitors and actually put them on the surface of an exoplanet and they can talk about things like uh, weather and geology, how we discovered this particular planet. Um, so we'll use a combination of um, computer animations and any real data we have to actually uh, put the patrons on the, or the visitors on those planets. Um, and what's really great is we provide the kind of scroll, the spiel for them to talk about the exoplanet that they're visiting. Um, and we found with some of our um, summative evaluation of our library exhibits that this is the content that they walk away with the most because they read it on the screen, they're repeating it back, then they see it again when they replay their video. So this is a really cool piece. Um, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll send NASA astronaut kind of costumes for the kids and adults, they come in adult sizes, uh, to wear while they're doing this interaction. Um, so again, pretty cool piece. Um, we put it in the museum um, in the museum exhibit because um, it is a little louder, and we're going to kind of redesign this from our previous library exhibits um, so that it is a little sturdier than we've done before, um, which means it'll take a little more effort to put together, and we're hoping the museum folks will be up for it. Um, next is that constellation interactive that I mentioned. So that's the one where we're going to actually have kind of stars on spikes and uh, they'll put the spikes, they won't be spikes, they'll be round little pegs um, <laughs> into a pegboard on the floor and be able to create your own constellation. So um, we'll give kind of a map like, oh, if you want to create Orion, do it this way. If you want to uh, recreate Cassiopeia, do it this way. And then encourage the participants to kind of walk around the constellation and get an idea that these are just pictures that we've made in our heads, right? Those stars aren't necessarily related to one another. Um, and they'll be able to create their own, too. And again, it's really nice to have this kind of hands-on piece uh, to talk about what is normally a very hands-off uh, sort of topic. Uh, Jennifer, yes, really quick, this recording will be available so that you can watch it again then, absolutely. Um, and then the last piece here is called Micro Observatory. Um, so this is a really neat piece. Um, Amelia, I've just completely forgot whose piece this is. If you're still here, if you wouldn't mind typing it in the chat box. Um, but this is a piece where you can actually get information um, from... Uh, telescopes cross country that are actually doing real observations. Um, so you can request a picture of a certain set of objects and it'll get emailed to you. You can learn more about it and manipulate the data a little bit. Um, it's a really cool piece. Thank you, uh, Smithsonian Harvard. Thank you, Amelia. My brain had turned off for a moment there. Uh, this is a really neat piece. We had it in our large uh, Great Balls of Fire exhibit, which just went off tour after six years on tour, which is a very, very long time for you museum people. Um, for a museum um, exhibit to keep touring. Um, and that will be in here as well. And then a couple banners, TBD, um, think pretty pictures, right, um, about the exoplanet and the astrophysics content. Um, Michael, uh, we, we do not have a, a transcription service. If there's particular pieces that you had trouble with, um, we can certainly um, get those typed, uh, get that typed out for you. We'll just need a little bit extra info of um, where there was an issue. Thank you, Brooks. All right, so I'm going to quickly now go through um, the actual proposal, just kind of give you the hints and the tips and the tricks for writing a good proposal. Um, and again, remember, only one of the venues needs to be filling out this application. I would greatly encourage you to do it together, right, if you have that, um, if you have the opportunity to do so. But I do not need separate applications from the library and museum partners. Just one is great. Um, so the first question here, this is kind of your opportunity to, to brag about the cool stuff you've done, what's unique about your community, um, and why I should look at your application and say, yes, your venue should get it. So describe why your library or museum wants to host this exhibit. So again, community interest in STEM topics, your demographics, this is very important. Who are your underserved communities? Um, what collections you might already have that this will kind of work together with? Um, other resources or programming, um, focus areas related to space science and the search for exoplanets, um, and your prior experiences with hosting traveling exhibitions or offering public programs about STEM. Now, if you're reading this question and your answer is, I have never hosted an exhibit, we've never done STEM, 
but my community is super interested and this is why we want to do it. That is a very good and a very appropriate answer. Um, kind of just the general rule of thumb here. If there's something that you don't have experience with, you need to convince me that I need to be the one giving you that experience. So don't look at that and think, oh, I shouldn't apply. Look at it and think, here's where I make my case. Uh, question number two, uh, what do you hope to accomplish by bringing this exhibition to the community? Um, again, think about what our focus is. Our focus here is on partnerships. Um, what I want to see in this question is how you're going to leverage us kind of forcing you to partner, um, how you're going to leverage that into a long lasting relationship. If you are already partnered um, with your secondary applicant venue, tell me how this is going to help you bring that partnership to the next level. Um, again, this is really the opportunity to make your case um, and uh, partnerships is something I would really focus on here, hint, hint. Um, number three, um, the focus here on reaching underserved audiences with STEM programming. So I hope in question one, you address your underserved audience a little bit, but three is where you can really highlight it. So um, things like your census data, um, your visitor data, right? Who is walking through your doors? Who is not walking through your doors? Um, it is absolutely appropriate to make the case that this community uh, or this population in our community is not currently visiting our venue. But we think that with this exhibit, we'll be able to do targeted outreach to X community and bring them in. Um, so again, are you just in a, generally speaking, underserved um, or underrepresented area? That's great. Tell me about that. Do you have a specific audience that you want to bring in? Great. Tell me that. Or again, uh, if you're already doing a great job, um, somebody wrote me that they already have a really good relationship um, with their Native American population that lives a couple miles away. Please do tell me about that. It does not have to be a new audience. It could be supplementing something you're already doing. Um, oh, somebody down there asked who the exhibit designer is. Uh, the fabricator is Flint Hills Design in Kansas City, and the exhibit designer is me, um, <laughs> along with James Harold and Evaldus Vidudris here um, at the Space Science Institute, um, and then the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Space Telescope Science Institute are also participating in the exhibit design. Um, somebody asked if the exhibit resources will be available in Spanish as well. Um, this is, I, I know this is not the answer you want, um, this is a, a, a very small dollar amount project, so I am making an effort to find hands-on activities and resources, um, so existing things that are already translated. We do not currently have um, the budget or the plans to translate the exhibit text into Spanish. Um, however, if when I am going through the application, that is a very common request and concern, so please put it in the application. Um, we will work on it and see what we can do. Um, the, the panels themselves will, will likely not be bilingual, but we, um, we have often been able to have kind of a printout laminated guide in other languages to go along with it. Um, so again, please do let me know. Um, in your application if that is something that you are interested in. And uh, question number three is a great place to put that information. Um, we will also need you to describe your general general publicity plans for the exhibition. So, you know, we are targeting X underserved audience with this sort of publicity. Um, I don't need you to upload a, a real publicity plan. I don't need you to mock up posters for me. It's not that. I just want to know how you interact um, with your community. Um, Oh, that's a good question, Liz. Um, I want to know how you interact with your community um, and where you are already um, promoting your things. Um, Liz, that's a very good question. Would this exhibit benefit patrons with low vision? Um, so we try, um, and I think we do an okay job, um, with all of our computer interactives um, to keep everything, um, there's you know certain guidelines that we follow that keep everything usable um, by people with low vision to a certain tolerance. Um, a lot of the hands-on components such as that um, ooh, constellation piece that I was describing earlier will also be very good, kind of the tactile experience. Um, if uh, patrons or visitors with low vision are one of your targeted underserved populations, uh, please again indicate that in question three. 
Um, we kind of pride ourselves in trying to design our exhibit around the communities that we're going to. So that's why we do this application process so far ahead of time. If I hear that these things um, are real needs in the communities that we're going to, we can try to work around them. So thank you very much for bringing that up. Uh, number five here, um, again, this is a partnership program, but beyond the two partners that we are um, describing with the library and the museum, we also want you guys to collaborate with other STEM organizations um, and individuals. So this could be if you work with your local um, solar system ambassadors or night sky network, um, if you've got university connections that have NASA or NSF funding, tell us about those people. So who have you worked with um, before um, that has some of this STEM content expertise that will be wanting um, and excited to help you? Or maybe who you haven't worked with yet that you're hoping that this program um, will provide you with information about. Um, I will give you guys a little clue here for those of you on the webinar. Um, we have a related project called NASA at My Library. Um, and if you go to the NASA at My Library section on our website, which is the uh, starnetlibraries.org, um, we have a list of um, kind of NASA connections that you might consider um, hooking up with or looking into um, to host STEM related programming. Again, Solar System Ambassadors Night Sky Network is kind of the, the easiest ones, but you'll see what works. Um, with your, excuse me, with your own geographic areas. Um, number six, we want to hear about your programs. So again, there's a, requ a requirement of 10 programs across both of your venues. Um, at least three of these programs must have a strong NASA connection, um, and at least two must utilize or develop some connection across the venues, like we talked about before. Um, you can certainly do more programs than that if you know that, okay, we've got this 15 program thing we want to do. Go ahead and tell me about all 15, but um, I do want to hear at least tentative titles and descriptions of all 10 programs here. Um, this is a place where um, you'll probably need to talk to your secondary applicant to make sure that you've got their programs considered too. Um, I am not at all expecting you to have these programs fully planned out, and if these programs change by the time you're hosting the exhibit, that's fine too. Um, this is really just my opportunity to get an, excuse me, get an idea of what you guys think um, this exhibit and the content lends itself to and to hear about the cool stuff that you're doing. Uh, yeah, Jennifer, so three have to have a strong NASA tie-in. Obviously, we're expecting all of them to be um, space science related, but that doesn't necessarily mean NASA, right? Um, the other two that I mentioned are uh, two programs that work across the venues. Um, so that could mean someone from the museum uh, coming to participate in a hands-on activity at the library. Um, it could mean library staff bringing some of their resources over to the museum, or it could be that the two venues uh, co-host an event in a totally different location, right? Like at a mall or a community center um, where you're kind of bringing the expertise from your two venues together. Um, it's very, very open. Um, whatever you guys um, want to do and are comfortable doing here, um, please let us know. Um, but there is um, only two of those 10 have to kind of be cross-organization. Kelsey, that's a good question. Um, she asked if these 10 programs occur during the exhibit time frame or throughout the year. Um, they should happen while the exhibit um, is there. So this is a three-month exhibit period. So they should happen within those three months. Um, that said, um, we can fudge it um, at the beginning. So if you want to have kind of a teaser event before the exhibit gets there, that would totally count towards this requirement. But if it's like, you know, six months later and it happens to be about the same content, um, just for the sake of our reporting, we need it all to be in that kind of contiguous three months. It's a very good question. Um, Brittany, good question. She asked if the exhibits stay up the entire time or if they only put them up when they host a program. So the exhibits do stay up. Um, they will be pretty easy to, to take down and to put up, but um, by easy I mean uh, a few hours, half a day of your time. So you wouldn't want to uh, move them around and the idea is that they would be up the entire time um, that the exhibition is there. Um, the number seven, so this goes right to that question, is where will the exhibition be displayed in your venue? Um, I don't need a lot of detail here. You can just upload a picture if you want, saying this is where we're going to put the exhibit. Um, or you can do it in text and say, look, I do not have 600 contiguous square feet, so I'm going to put it 
Um, I'm going to put this piece by the circulation desk. I'm going to put these three pieces over in children's. If you're at the museum, I'm going to put these three pieces in the lobby. I just want to make sure that you've thought through where this stuff is going to go because it has happened in the past that we've sent an exhibit out and pieces have had to stay in storage because they did not fit. Um, so I really just want to know that you've taken the time to make sure these things are going to fit in your venue. Um, and again, tell me a little bit about your internet access as well. Um, if it will be problematic that there is that one piece um, that needs to stay online the whole time, um, this is a place to let me know. Like we simply cannot do that. Um, we can find something. Uh, we can find a way around that for you. It's a, it's a preference, um, very high in the preference category. But if this is problematic for a lot of people, we'll find a way around it. Um, so I'm just going to get through these two really quick and then I'll start going back to you guys' questions there. Um, we also want to know how you're going to work with educators and schools in your area um, and an estimate of how many school age children might visit. Um, this is really the opportunity for you to tell me, hey, we do field trips. Um, we normally get this many kids coming through um, to see the exhibitions. Um, and this is true for both the libraries and the museums. Um, if you do not already have a good relationship with the schools in your communities, this is an opportunity for you to tell me, hey, you know, we don't actually work with them yet, but um, these are the populations that are represented in those schools, and this is the type of program we think we might do um, to convince them to come. Um, so you can be a little flexible with this question. Um, and then nine, um, this is where we want you to describe your plans to partner with your secondary applicant. Um, so what the shared programs across venues look like. Um, maybe the museum or the library has a meteorite collection or something, right? And you're going to share across. Uh, this is very specific to you, and I don't really want to give too many examples because it's whatever you want to make of it. Um, so a narrative description of what that partnership looks like. Um, Again, hint, hint, if your narrative description includes what your partnership looks like after the exhibit is gone, that would be great. Um, and then please also um, attach the letter of commitment from the secondary applicant. This doesn't need to be any more than a page long. Um, I just want to hear from that secondary applicant that, yes, someone has asked me to do this and I am agreeing to do it. Um, I don't want it to be a surprise to them um, if they end up with an exhibit on their doorstep. All right, so I've got some frequently asked questions here, but I'm going to go um, and catch some of these questions I've missed before I do that. Um, so someone asked how close in location the museum and the library have to be. I am being very flexible here. Our original intent was to have um, venues in the same community, right? So the idea that maybe you can't walk, but it's a quick bus ride sort of thing. Um, but I've had a couple people email me saying, look, I am literally in the middle of nowhere and the closest a uh, venue like the secondary venue you describe is an hour away or two hours away. Someone from Alaska told me that's fine. You just need to have a strong plan for partnering with that venue. Um, please do remember um, for the sake of the programs where you have to have the two that are between the venues um, cross collaboration. If you are two hours away, I am absolutely not expecting someone from the organizations to drive that two hours. Do you have a cool way to digitally do a program together? Can you do a program at the library and at the museum at the same time and kind of Skype the results back and forth? That is a great use of that required um, program. So kind of use your imagination here. Um, you know, that said, if um, my library is in New York City and they tell me that they want to partner with a museum in DC. That's, that's unnecessary. I know New York City has other museums. Um, so it's really, it's going to be on a case by case basis based on your um, geographic location. If you're rural and remote, um, the distance spreads. If you are in the middle of a city, um, we're hoping that you find someone, you know, pretty darn close. Um, approximate square footage of each piece. That's a very good question. Um, so again, we try to keep these pieces so that they will fit through a normal, uh, a kind of standard doorway. Um, so the um, the kiosk pieces are a, um, I believe, 30 inch monitor, and then there's an additional three or four inches on each side um, to accommodate the 
the shipping box, um, but that's as big as they are, and they're kind of square. So that size in each direction, someone do math for me. Um, but it's not a very big footprint. Um, the, the 600 square feet is to allow for ADA compliance. Um, it is certainly not 600 square feet of stuff. It is, if you put it in one location, it would take 600 square feet to be ADA compliant around every single piece. Um, so the individual pieces themselves are pretty small. The exception to that um, is going to be that constellation piece we talked about in the museum um, exhibit. We are imagining that that is big enough for people to kind of walk in and out of. So kind of imagine a typical desk or table size is probably the footprint of that. Um, but again, um, our plans are all tentative right now, so you'll have to give me a little bit of leeway on um, sizes for that. Does the one piece require an Ethernet connection or Wi-Fi? Kelsey, again, you have all the good questions. So yeah, that one piece, Discover Exoplanets, I would actually prefer a hardwired connection for that one. Um, the new way that they're running that piece um, requires that it is running kind of off of their web server. So you need to have a constant connection, and if you lose that connection, that piece won't work anymore. Um, this is the opportunity, guys. If that is not feasible for a large number of you, please do tell me down in the comments, and I will talk to our... Um, friends at JPL and see what we can do there. Um, but currently, yes, that is the one piece that does require a constant connection um, and hardwired is going to be preferred there. Um, Nancy asked if we need to describe the space and traffic flow for both sites. Um, that's a good question and I had not thought of that earlier. I really did only give you space to describe it in the primary institution. Um, if the secondary institution could describe that a little bit in their letter of support, that will be sufficient. Or if you want to do, um, do it in the application, that's fine too. Um, frankly, um, just so that you all are aware, that question is really um, so that I know um, the libraries, which will tend to be the smaller venues here, that they've really thought about it. Um, I'm, I'm trusting that the museums have hosted more traveling exhibitions and know their space, but yes, if you could get me that information in the support letter, that would actually be very helpful. Uh, Christina, uh, specific requirements for the museum, planetarium, slash observatory partner. Um, so I want to make it clear here, any of the either venue, right, the library or the museum, planetary, and observatory um, can be the primary applicant. Um, it does not have to be the library. Um, I am just used to libraries, so I'm probably saying that more right now. Um, everyone's requirements are the same. So when I went through that list of requirements, um, the only thing that really differs across the venues um, is going to be the um, museum exhibit. You might need to store more stuff, um, and so it doesn't I, I do not care which venue does more of the programs or if you guys split the venues in half. The requirements are the same. Um, one representative from the library and one representative from the museum will be coming uh, to our workshop. So really just think about this. It is really a, a, a partnership activity. Um, I'm not expecting either partner to carry the load one way or another. I'm really expecting everyone to, to work closely together. Michael, yes, I would be happy uh, to repeat the information about the training session. So there will be a training session held uh, late August, early September. I'll get the dates posted as soon as I have them um, here in Boulder or Denver, Colorado, somewhere around here. Um, it will be a two-day training. So the idea is we'll spend one day um, at the Shakedown Library venue, um, looking at the exhibit, meeting with some of our project partners, uh, doing hands-on activities, and then we'll spend the next day at the museum doing the same thing. Um, like I said, these exhibits are very different, um, and we realize that libraries and museums might have different requirements um, and uh, requests when it comes to um, what their activities look like in their venues. So I'll be working closely with all of the chosen venues prior to that workshop um, to make sure that everybody is getting out of that training what they need. Um, if it turns out um, that, for example, the hands-on pieces, really the librarians want stuff totally different than the museum staff, then we'll do two concurrent training sessions. And um, we've got a lot of options here, and I do expect to work with the chosen sites um, very closely to, to build that agenda. Um, is information on the website to take an insurer to get a quote for replacement insurance? Um, 
Amanda, maybe you could rephrase that question. I think maybe I'm just missing a word there. Um, so yeah, you should have an existing, let me actually go to one of my FAQs um, where I have the real language there. So the question I keep getting from people is, my organization is self-insured. How does the insurance requirement work? Um, so I talked to our lawyer. Um, so she said that in almost every case, um, even if you're self-insured, you'll still be contracted with an underwriter who deals with your paperwork should some claim arise. Um, that underwriter just needs to provide a signed document indicating that you're self-insured and can financially handle the claim. If you don't have an underwriter, um, which sometimes is the case if you are a government entity, um, we would just need a signed or notarized letter um, from the equivalent of your chief financial officer um, or, again, an elected official if you are a government entity um, indicating that your organization can assume the risk. So, again, this letter is either from your current insurance provider um, or if you're self-insured from your, excuse me, um, from your underwriter or your CFO um, telling me that the organization can assume the risk. Um, we haven't had anyone not able to provide us this, so um, if this doesn't sound familiar to you, it might just be that you're not the person who normally deals with this, um, but do talk to your um, business offices um, and we will, um, you know, let me know if you have questions and we can work through that. Um, so Nancy asked if StarNet's going to provide lesson plans that libraries and museums can share with classroom teachers to help them prepare students for a visit. So yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry guys, I don't normally do this in my office, as you can tell. Um, so we do um, we do normally provide uh, teacher guides and parent guides um, for our exhibits. Um, so that will be something that you can provide to the parents or the teachers slash educators ahead of time. Um, that will send them, excuse me, to, oh, thank you, Brooks, uh, that will send them to uh, classroom, uh, family, home-friendly, right, um, activities on our clearinghouse or else um, on an existing NASA site as well. Um, but, yeah, this is something that we, we normally provide, so that, that will be there. Um, Christina asks if there is, um, if nonprofit status is required, um, so that's a very good question. Um, so we are expecting the libraries all to be nonprofit, certainly. On the museum side, if you are a for profit entity, um, please send me a separate email and we can just really quickly talk through. Um, we, we do have some requirements and they would take more time than I have to explain on the webinar right now. Um, it, it, it is uh, nonprofit entities can apply. We just need some information about your public benefit statements and things like that. So um, send me an email separate from this and we can talk if you fall there. Um, Catherine asks, do all 10 of the programs offered need to be free of charge? This is a very good question and I did get a lot of questions around this. So yes, you cannot charge for these programs. Um, for the libraries, this is not normally a problem. They don't tend to charge for programs. For the museums, however, if you charge admission to get into the museum, that is fine. You cannot, though, charge a separate admission um, for that program or for um, entry to our exhibit. So we're not going to tell you that you can't collect your normal door fees. That's fine. But you can't charge an additional fee for um, anything from this program. So that's a very good question. Um, so the um, replacement cost of the exhibit is approximately $70,000 for um, each exhibit. So if the truck disappears, I'm out a lot more than that, but each venue is only $70,000. Um, um, so Michelle says they're not a 501c3, um, but are an organization that is not for profit making and have that documentation. Is that fine? Yes, that's absolutely fine um, if you don't have your documentation yet. Sorry, Kelsey, you're right, 60K, not 70K. I am making things up. Kelsey has read everything far more than I have, and we should ask Kelsey. <laughs> I'm glad, no, it's very good to see that people actually read my guidelines. Um, so guys, go ahead and keep uh, putting questions down in that box, and let me really quickly go through the FAQ. Um, so we already talked about uh, this continuous internet connection piece. Um, the other question I'm getting a lot of is, does my planetarium, visitor center, university, museum, etc., qualify for this project? Uh, so in almost every case, yes. Um, the most important thing, like I just said, is you can't charge an additional fee to view the exhibit or the associated programmings. Um, and your venue must be open to any individual or group who may wish to visit it. And I add this 
um, because someone contacted me specifically saying that they're only open to uh, members of this particular university, I think is what they said, that only staff and students could visit. So you would not qualify um, if you um, limit entrance to a specific group of people, um, protected classes, all of that, right? You know where I'm, where I'm heading. Um, so it's totally fine, like I said, if you're a, a university or a museum, or a university museum, but it has to be open to the public. Um, they can charge, you can charge a fee for them to get in, um, but not to get into the exhibit itself. Um, as someone also asked me, what if a paid staff member from my institution can't attend the in-person training? Um, this is actually okay. So the requirement is that um, a responsible party or designee uh, from each venue must attend. We realize that some libraries and museums have one paid staff member who can't really leave. Um, if that's the case, um, we will uh, need some documentation around it. But if there is a volunteer who's going to be in charge of this exhibit and the programming when it's at your venue, they can absolutely be the person who comes to the training. Um, but you will need to make the case for that, right, um, that this volunteer is going to stick around um, and that they need to be the one attending. But that was a good question as well. Um, we already talked about the insurance. Um, this question, I feel bad. I answered it a couple times today. Um, I started my proposal. Where did it go? Um, so unfortunately, again, since this is a, a small and small dollar amount program, um, we are using SurveyMonkey for the applications. We have the settings um, set so that if you start your application, close it, and come back, um, as long as you are on the same computer and the same browser, it should pull up your application. It will remember you. Um, that said, it is a sometimes dangerous feature, and sometimes it, um, whether your browser's not set to save cookies or whatever, um, it won't recognize you when you come back. Um, so what I recommend you do, um, we've got the full set of narrative questions available in that guidelines document. Go ahead and type everything up first and then copy paste it into the document. Um, if it is too late for that, if you have already lost your work, I still have access to any application that's been started. So just drop me an email. Um, and I can go copy paste out anything that you've started and lost um, so that you don't need to start completely start over. Um, but again, that, that feature is there for in case um, you need it, but I would um, avoid it if you can. Um, Amanda says, what about a university library who is a federal depository open to the public? Yes, you guys are um, absolutely welcome to apply. Now, when I see university library pop up in the application, I am going to assume that you don't do public programs, that the public doesn't tend to come to your venue, so the burden is on you uh, to provide I don't need documentation necessarily, but provide information about what programming you provide for the general public um, so that I know it's not a situation of, well, they can come in, but they don't. Um, we do need some sort of statement that the public does use your venue. Um, deadline for application. That's a great question, which I should have sitting here right in front of me. Kelsey, do you remember? <laughs> um, I believe it's uh, January 5th. Oh, Kelsey got it. Uh, January 5th, 2018. I would recommend that you all turn it in a little bit before that if you can, just to make sure um, we don't have any problems, excuse me, with the Survey Monkey losing your work. Um, we are going to make our decisions pretty quickly um, after we have all of this in again, like I said, so that I can start talking with the venues who are going to host um, to make sure that the, the timing all works out. You have an opportunity in the application to let me know um, what your time frames are. Um, and also to make sure I can start working with people about what the um, workshop should look like. So uh, January 5th is the drop dead. If you can get it to me a little bit sooner, again, that would be helpful. Uh, Bookie, that's Survey Monkey. Uh, Brooks, if you're still here, if you wouldn't mind uh, typing in <laughs> uh, that URL. So that Survey Monkey application is linked from our website, the starnetlibraries.org, under Discover Exoplanets. Um, and if uh, Brooks doesn't get that in there, I'm not sure if he's still here or not, um, um, just drop me an email and I can make sure that you get that link. Um, so far, only 13 people have started their application. Um, I'm hoping that's because you've looked at it um, in the guidelines and started it elsewhere, um, but do, do make sure you all get that started. Uh, Maria says they are a rural library partnering with the museum in a nearby city. Do we need to provide demographic information for both locations? Yes, that would be uh, perfect. So what I'm expecting is that the primary applicant, Maria, if that's you, the library, 
um, would be providing their demographic information in the actual um, SurveyMonkey proposal, and that the secondary venue, they can either also provide it there or they can provide it in their letter of support. Um, it's whatever um, works best for you. But yes, I do. If you're not in the same location, I would like to hear about both. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ruth, for uh, <laughs> this is a team effort here, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you for posting that uh, SurveyMonkey link. Um, do remember, excuse me, if you are doing the SurveyMonkey and you plan on closing it and coming back, you do need to use the same browser and computer. Um, we don't have a um, login option. Um, Susan says, read the secondary site. Could you give other examples of informal education sites that are acceptable partners for libraries that are not museums? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the big ones um, are planetariums and visitor centers. Um, somebody asked earlier, oh, I have, sorry, I have my list of questions over here. Someone asked if a history museum was fine, and yes, absolutely. Um, your biggest thing, if it's someone who... Um, Excuse me, your biggest thing if your secondary partner is not someone who normally does um, science sorts of exhibit is, um, is, is kind of convincing them that this is something that they need to do. Um, our Great Balls of Fire exhibit, which was about asteroids and comets, it went to the Corvette Museum. So it went to a car museum, um, <laughs> which uh, was pretty cool. But the idea, right, kind of the, the sell, if you're trying to get it to a venue that doesn't normally do science, is everyone is very interested in STEM right now. Uh, parents are very interested in getting their kids uh, participating in STEM. Funders are very interested. Um, in venues who are doing STEM. Um, so it's really a nice way to attract a new audience segment. So if you're reaching out to someone like a history museum or, you know, a county visitor center would be totally fine. Um, you know, just, you know, you might have to give them the hard sell about why they should do an exoplanet exhibit. But I do think it's feasible and it's something uh, with our museum exhibits we've been doing actually for quite some time. We've had, like I said, the Corvette Museum. Um, we had a local history museum in Massachusetts, I think. Um, I'm trying to think of other um, informal learning venues that I haven't listed. If anyone else has one that pops to mind, um, please do it. Like I said, we're pretty flexible here. Um, if you have a question and we, we don't mention that particular venue on the call, please do email me. But we are flexible with that requirement. Um, Bookie asked if we can use a branch of their library for the secondary site. Unfortunately, no. Um, our goal here is to get partnerships forming across different sorts of venues. Um, so you would need to reach out to some other sort of venue for your secondary site. Um, now that said, and I have this over here in my document, um, someone had asked me before, you know, well, Annie, how flexible can you be? What if it's a tribal library as a second library? If you can make a good case for me that you're reaching a partner you haven't worked with before that has a, a very different, diverse, underserved, whatever audience, um, like a tribal library in the next uh, county over, uh, that is something we might consider, but I will need you to get um, the approval beforehand. So just drop me an email and I can let you know. <laughs> Thank you. All of a sudden, people can remember things that I couldn't. Um, Amelia mentioned Botanic Garden. That would be great. Um, a zoo. Um, what's really great about those types of venues is they tend to have mostly um, outdoor um, sort of exhibits, and their indoor stuff doesn't get looked at as much. So this would be a great opportunity um, for them to put something hands-on and interactive um, in their inside space. Um, nature centers, absolutely, um, would also be fine. Um, we, um, Like I mentioned before, we haven't actually done this before um, as far as a primary and a secondary site, so excuse our um, kind of uh, sounding like we're making this up as we go. This is kind of a test uh, program here. Uh, but yes, our exhibits have gone to nature centers in the past, and that's, again, as long as they have enough indoor space uh, to host it, that would be great. Um, Kelsey, yeah, that's absolutely right. IMAX theaters, um, if they have the space and are willing, that would be great too. Um, again, just the important thing is it needs to be a venue that does some sort of uh, public programming, right? So if they're the type of people that do um, programming for the general public, uh, generally speaking, we're in good shape. Um, somebody asked, do we know how much time between the selection and the exhibit arriving? Um, I think my partner museum books fairly far into the future. Yeah, that's a very good point, and that's why um, we want to make these decisions soon. So we're hoping that by February 1, um, we will have our decisions made and we will have informed everyone. Um, we will also definitely take into account um, what you guys put on your application as far as your preferred time periods. Um, again, this is a place where please, please make sure you talk to your secondary applicant. Um, if you tell me that 
you know, venue slot number two works great for you. And then I make the announcements and your, um, your partner site says, yeah, that's not going to work for us. I might need to give the exhibit to the next in line. Um, so do make sure that you talk with your partner sites. Uh, what's time frame for the exhibit to be up and running? Yep, so the um, exhibits will be arriving to those two local shakedown sites in August, um, and then the workshop will be happening soon thereafter. Um, so that'll be um, August, September, October. So the actual tour um, with you guys will start around October. Lauren, yes, the applications, uh, application questions are available outside of the SurveyMonkey. Those are in the application guidelines that are, again, um, at the StarnetLibraries.org site. <laughs> Kelsey is on top of it. Kelsey is hired. <laughs> That's great. Um, and then I had one more question from earlier. Um, someone asked if every event um, needs to be related to exoplanets or if it can be related to NASA and astronomy. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, our program requirements, like some of our other requirements, um, are very flexible. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if it's related to NASA and it's related to astronomy, that's absolutely fine. You will notice in the requirements it said three of the um, programs had to be very closely related to the exhibit content. So at least three have to be exoplanets or the other astrophysics themes that are in the exhibit, but the rest of them, yes, can be more um, kind of tangential, but in the same realm kind of activities. That's, that's very common. I, I will use an example from one of our Discover Earth libraries, one of their required programs. Um, they actually got the Discover Earth exhibit right after, um, I believe it was Hurricane Sandy hit, um, and they actually had local fishermen come and talk about how the hurricane um, had kind of messed up their fishing grounds and they were going to have to move elsewhere. That had very little to do with the actual exhibit content, but it was absolutely um, a relevant and I think really good um, program around the content area. So flexibility is definitely okay there in the programs. Um, Kelsey asks, if a book club read a book about exoplanets or astrophysics, could that be considered a related event? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, that's a very good point that I don't think I mentioned in the guidelines. These programs can be ongoing programs. The caveat there is if you've got a book club, you can't count each meeting of the book club towards your 10 required programs. The book club would be one program. Um, but yes, absolutely, and that's a, a really good use, and that's um, also a really good way for the libraries and museums or other informal uh, partner uh, to work together, um, is to kind of do those programs at both venues, which would be really cool. All right, so I'm going to, I see people dropping off. I know we're past our time. I'm going to stick around and keep answering questions, and again, the recording is still on if people need to leave, um, but please do feel free uh, to start start dropping off if you have to go here, and you can uh, come back to the questions later if you need to. Um, a STEAM and culture nonfiction book club. That sounds fun. <laughs> I want to come. <laughs> um, Amelia, before everyone drops off, did you have any um, last-minute things you wanted to add? I appreciate you sticking around. <laughs> Um, so Sam, oh, I'm sorry, Sam, I saw your question and I copy pasted it and then I lost it. Um, so Sam said that they share a DUNS number with their partner as they're both departments of the same county. Will that cause you to choose? Absolutely not. Just make sure that you indicate that in your application and remind me. Um, so there are, um, again, I'm very glad you asked that question because there were a couple people that contacted me saying that their library and museum were physically in the same building. That would not work um, if you are kind of one entity like that. Um, we do really want this to be um, new partnerships. Um, but if you have the same kind of organizational structure, right, like if you're a county entity and you're in two separate buildings or a building with a big wall in between, that's totally fine. You just can't be the same organization. <laughs> Liz, thank you. I'm glad it sounds like fun. I obviously think it's fun. <laughs> um, Chris, are all the exhibits 360 kiosks or are some 180 degree against the wall exhibits? Uh, that's a very good question. So the, the panels are mostly, um, you know, one side only so that you can put them against a wall. The, the kiosks are like that too. There's um, very few pieces and I think the big exceptions are the constellation piece 
in the um, in the museum exhibit and the transit piece in the library exhibit. Those ones will require that you can walk around them. Everything else could be placed against a wall um, or back to back even if that's what worked in your space. Yes, Renee, partners are good. If anyone needs help finding a partner, um, do feel free to contact me. I know, I know some people. <laughs> All right, guys, well, if there's no further questions, it looks like Amelia said that um, she didn't have anything to add. Um, we are looking forward to seeing your applications. If you have any trouble with the Survey Monkey um, or anything else, please do feel free to drop me a line. Uh, please do not call me. Everyone here will attest my uh, phone messages get filled up way too quick and I will miss it. But there's my email address um, if you want to contact me. Uh, Kelsey, for contracts, are we required to sign one immediately or do we have time for consideration? Uh, that's a very good question. So the way that process will work is we will make the initial um, announcement. We'll let everybody know that they've been selected and what their time frame looks like. We will immediately want a, yes, we're planning on doing this and that time frame works for us. If then once you get the contract, there is some issue that you guys aren't able to sign it, um, then yeah, we'd have to move on to the next venue, but you will have time to do that. We'll need immediate, yes, I'm interested, but you do have time to sign the actual contract and make sure that works for you. All right, guys, it was really great talking to you all. Um, please do look for the recording probably either sometime tomorrow or Friday. That will be ready. And again, <coughs> excuse me, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you, Amelia, for joining us. And thanks, Brooks, for uh, hanging out in the background there and doing the technical support for us. Everybody have a good day.